Being you, you. Today's topic relates to our second principle. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. from James Baldwin. It is not too much to say that whoever wishes to become a truly moral human being must first divorce oneself from all prohibitions, crimes, and hypocrisies of the Christian church. If the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it's time we got rid of him. Our transitional words from James Baldwin. Time catches up with kingdoms and crushes them, gets its teeth into doctrines and rends them. Time reveals the foundations on which any kingdom rest and eats at those foundations, and it destroys doctrines by proving them untrue. Today's speaker is Reverend Bill Breeden, and his topic is Remembering James Baldwin. Today uh, is a little different than most of the Sundays that I speak to you good folks at the UU Church of Terre Haute, Indiana, and to anyone else who happens to be tuning in. Because of COVID in our presence, we're not meeting in person in the sanctuary uh, in the month of January, and so I'm relegated to making a video, which I... Uh, I have to say, this is the hardest work I've ever done. Uh, preaching is fun when you have people listening because it's dialogical. Even if they don't say anything, they respond emotionally in other ways. And uh, I get energy from that. 
working with my own phone is not nearly as much fun. But I have uh, the opportunity this morning to share with you a gift that I recently received. And it's a, a gift uh, for a 72-year-old man to read a book of less than 100 pages and upon reading it, recognize that it is one of the most important books of his life is a real gift. This book, James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, I believe is one of the most important books I've ever read, and I encourage you to read it. It should be read in every high school in this country, and uh, one should not be able to graduate without reading this book. And if you really want to look into the uh, understand the racial tensions that we live with today, I highly recommend this. It begins with a letter to his nephew that was written on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's entitled, My Dungeon Shook. Dear James, I've begun this letter five times and five times I have torn it up. I keep seeing your faith, which is also the face of your father and my brother, like him, you are tough, vulnerable, moody, with a very definite tendency to sound truculent because you want no one to think you are soft. You may be like my grandfather in this, I don't know, but certainly both you and your father resemble him very much physically. Well, he is dead. He never saw you, and he had a terrible life. He was defeated long before he died because at the bottom of his heart, he really believed what white people said about him. This is one of the reasons that he became so holy. I'm sure that your father has told you something about all that. Neither you nor your father exhibit any tendency toward holiness. You really are of another era, part of what happened to the Negro when the Negro left the land and came into what the late E. Franklin Fraser called the cities of destruction. You can only be destroyed by believing that you really are what the white world calls a nigger. I tell you this because I love you, and please don't you ever forget it. I have known both of you all of your lives, have carried your daddy in my arms and on my shoulders, kissed and spanked him, and watched him learn to walk. I don't know if you've known anybody that far back, if you've loved anybody that long, first as an infant, then as a child, then as a man. You gain a strange perspective on time and human pain and effort. Other people cannot see what I see whenever I look into your father's face, for behind your father's face as it is today are all those other faces which are his. Let him laugh and I see a cellar your father does not remember, and a house he does not remember, and I hear his present laughter in his present laughter, his laughter as a child. Let him curse and I remember him falling down the cellar and howling, and I remember with pain his tears, which my hand or your grandmother so easily wiped away. But no hand can wipe away those tears he sheds invisibly today, which one hears in his laughter and in his speech and in his songs. I know what the world has done to my brother and how narrowly he has survived it. And I know which is much worse. And this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen and for which I neither or neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. One can be, indeed one must strive to become, tough and philosophical concerning destruction and death, for this is what most of mankind has been best at since we have heard of man. But remember, most of mankind is not all of mankind. But it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. Now, my dear namesake, those innocent and well-meaning people, your countrymen, have caused you to be born under conditions not very far removed from those described for us by Charles Dickens in London of more than a hundred years ago. I hear the chorus of the innocent screaming, No, this is not true. How bitter you are. But I am writing this letter to you to try to tell you something about how to handle them. For most of them do not yet really know that you exist. I know the conditions under which you were born, for I was there. Your countrymen were not there and haven't made it yet. 
Your grandmother was also there, and no one has ever accused her of being bitter. I suggest that the innocents check with her. She isn't hard to find. Your countrymen don't know that she even exists, though she has been working for them all their lives. Well, you were born. Here you came. Something like 15 years ago, and though your father and mother and grandmother looking about the streets through which they were carrying you, staring at the walls into which they brought you, had every reason to be heavy-hearted, yet they were not. For here you were, Big James, named for me. You were a big baby. I was not. Here you were, to be loved. To be loved, baby, hard at once and forever. To strengthen you against the loveless world. Remember that. I know how black it looks today for you. It looked bad that day, too. Yes, we were trembling. We have not stopped trembling yet. But if we had not loved each other, none of us would have survived. And now you must survive because we love you and for the sake of your children and your children's children. The innocent, this innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which, in fact, it intended that you should perish. Let me spell out precisely what I mean by that. For the heart of the matter is here and the root of my dispute with my country. You were born where you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were expected to, you were not expected to aspire to, to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Whenever, wherever you have turned, James, in your short time on this earth, you have been told where you could go and what you could do and how you could do it and where you could live and whom you could marry. I know your countrymen do not agree with me about this. I hear them saying you exaggerate. They do not know Harlem as I do. So do you. Take no one's word for anything, including mine, but trust your experience. Know whence you came. If you know whence you came, there is really no limit to where you can go. The details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. Please try to remember that what they believe, as, le as well as what they do and cause you to endure, does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity and fear. Please try to be clear, dear James, through the storm which rages about your youthful head today, about the reality which lies behind the words acceptance and, inter and integration. There is no reason for you to try to become like white people, and there is no basis what forever, whatever for their impertinent assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them. And I mean that very seriously. You must accept them and accept them with love. For these are innocent people. For these innocent people have no hope. They are, in effect, still trapped in a history which they do not understand, and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had to believe for many years and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. Many of them indeed know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they believe and what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of, own sense of reality. Well, the black man has functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar. And as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundations. You don't be afraid. 
I said that it was intended that she should perish in the ghetto, perish by never being allowed to go behind, behind the white man's definitions, by never being allowed to spell, spell your proper name. You have, and many of, us have, many of us have, defeated this intention. And by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents that believed that your imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp of reality. But these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. And if the word in integration means anything, this is what it means, that we, with love, shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will do again. And we can make America what America must become. It will be hard, James, but you come from sturdy peasant stock, men who picked cotton and dammed rivers and built railroads, and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds, achieved an unassailable and monumental dignity. You come from a long line of great poets, some of the greatest poets since Homer. One of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. You know and I know that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom 100 years too soon. We cannot be free until they are free. God bless you, James, and Godspeed, your uncle, James. That letter, though written in language that we today would change, and James, I'm sure, would change it as well and be less... Uh, focused on the male gender. But I think that letter is one of the most powerful letters I've ever read. And to understand, uh, to understand that in order for any of us to be free, all of us must be free. I encourage you to read this book. It's a painful book. It's painful for, for uh, black people and white people. He speaks of the problems of the nation of Islam, and he speaks as, as an American. He speaks as an American citizen who believes in freedom for all, who believes in every person's dignity, every person's humanity. So I close uh, this reading with the, with the exhortation that you get the book and read it, and I hope you find in it a, a new understanding of what it means to be an American, what it means to be a human being. Thank you, and enjoy the reading.
For closing words, I've chosen another gem from James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. To be sensual, I think, is to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, and to be present in all that one does, from the effort of loving to the breaking of bread. May you go into the world and be sensual. May you be loving in all that you do. Blessed be. Hey folks, consider this a, a verbal postlude, if you will. I got to thinking about uh, the time of year it is, and uh, although it's colder and all get out today, uh, spring's coming. And as I read Baldwin's book and thought about his uh, message to us, uh, it's a difficult message. It's painful in places and loving in others. But uh, I got to thinking about the springtime coming and the word sensual that he used in the last reading. And there's nothing more sensual than planting a seed. And I thank Lisa Bear for being able to give us a graphic on that, the graphic of this seed planted long ago that ended up splitting the rock. It says we cannot force someone to hear a message they're not ready to receive, but we must never underestimate the power of planting a seed. Spring's going to be here before long, and I'm not much of a gardener myself. I do mostly the, the uh, grunt work of gardening, but I often am amazed by the way that Glenda plants seed because she does it lovingly. You can tell she is. it's a sensual act to plant those seeds. And I think we need to take that with us as we go into the world with our message of love and peace, that it is a sensual act to love people. And when we plant seeds, we cannot be sure that the person is ready to hear those seeds or to, or to receive those seeds, but we should not lose faith in the idea of the power of planting that seed that will come to fruition and split the rock of hate and split the rock of injustice and give us a world of peace and love. Take care. We'll see you again, hopefully in person before too long. Blessed be. May the blessings of love rest upon you. May peace abide with you. May God's presence illuminate your heart now and forevermore. Go in peace. Know that you are loved and that your life is sacred. Value Statement We value a sense of community, religious tolerance, cooperation, diversity, active social justice, and good works. Mission Statement We exist to provide a community for persons of diverse, liberal, religious beliefs and to 